Hello everyone, my name is Alex Murray. I'm a police officer in West Midlands, the West Midlands Police, uh, currently a temporary assistant chief constable. But for a long time uh, within policing, I've been interested in what works. Uh, and for that, you can read evidence-based policing. So how do we know what we're doing has a real impact? How do we measure that? How do we understand what's effective and what isn't effective? Uh, and as I learned about this, I I was astounded at uh, how much information there is out there that is really relevant to us. I, you know, I did a, a master's in criminology under uh, the professorship of Larry Sherman and was exposed to some of this stuff and thought, wow, uh, this is so relevant to everybody that everybody needs to know about it. And it, it was for that reason, really, I started a small uh, group of people, really, that became a charity called the Society of Evidence-Based Policing, really, that sought to get the message out there around what's effective and what isn't. And we're a, we're quite a small outfit of police officers and uh, police staff, but the, the idea is sort of contagious and there's now a, a Society of Evidence-Based Policing in Australia, New Zealand, Canada, America, starting in India, Scandinavia, uh, Spain. So um, we're professionals want to take control themselves really rather than being told always what to do um, to make a real difference. Okay well I won't do it quickly but I, I think it's um, quite ironic that in the police service we have thousands of rules on how you get evidence that you put before a court. You can only do it in certain ways, you have to know that the evidence is really good, you've got to test it and that testimony is really important and we understand the rationale for that. But when we are engaging in certain tactics or we have an idea, the level of evidence we require to start that idea or that tactic is non-existent. So someone just has a bright idea and they say, we're gonna do this from this point on. Um, and if we use examples of the bright ideas that have gone wrong, because they haven't been based on evidence, then that sometimes tells the story. So the, the famous one is of scared straight where police officers naturally think, well, what we need to do is get naughty kids, send them to a prison, get them to meet the inmates, and they'll be so scared that they won't commit crime anymore, antisocial behavior. And in fact, when they took an evidence-based approach, and we'll talk about what that means in a minute, it showed that the kids became worse as a result of that. Similarly, taking drugs into school and talking kids through drugs has shown to be at best ineffective and sometimes more harmful. So an evidence-based approach means we analyze whether the tactics we're engaging in are really effective or not uh, and it goes beyond where policing normally is which is uh, there's a problem we engage in a tactic and then we see if there's a problem after that uh, the sort of before and after approach that has plagued policing uh, and and i i equate it to this little story really you know i've been a senior leader in policing and but I've been a PC as well, and I've seen senior leaders stand up and say, you know, since I've taken over this command, burglary has gone down 20%. And what that leader is saying is, because of my great leadership, burglary has gone down 20%. And as a constable, I know that that's not down to your great leadership. Uh, but when crime goes up 20%, the same leader doesn't go in front of his staff or her staff and say, burglary has gone up and I'm sorry, it's because I'm a really rubbish police officer. Uh, and I don't know how to lead you, they start saying, you know, it's because sentences are too short, it's because there's issues with uh, the economy, no one can get a job, bad parenting, all these, you know, socioeconomic factors. Um, and the truth is, as a leader, you can't have it both ways. So we have to be evidence-based. And that means adopting research methods that will tell us whether we are being effective or not, uh, or research methods to understand what the real problem is uh, and it's saying what is the best way of trying to answer the question you're posing as a police officer so if it is how do we get burglary down how do we get robbery down how do we get violence down it's not saying I know the idea it's saying well I have an idea and I'm gonna test it to see whether that's effective I, I think that's a very long-winded way but probably a necessarily long-winded way of speaking through what evidence-based policing is. The relevance of an evidence-based approach in policing is quite new. So the phrase was only coined in 97 by Sherman in America. 
So evidence-based policy has sort of been around for longer than that. Evidence-based practice in medicine obviously has been a, around a lot longer than that. The, the method of thought, if you like, goes way back to the Enlightenment movement and the use of the scientific method around hypotheses, hypothesis testing, um, and testing what's observable. How that has become mainstream or is becoming mainstream in policing, I would say, is in only in the last 10 years. Um, and, you know, if you go back to medicine hundreds of years ago, they, they didn't have an evidence based approach. You know, only 150 years ago, people were still engaging in practices from a medical point of view that were incredibly harmful because it was just a good idea that had been passed down from generation to generation. I think right now we in policing are passing down ideas to each other that are still harmful to the citizen or to ourselves uh, because we haven't engaged in evidence-based approaches. So probably two things really. One is uh, the College of Policing really recognises that evidence-based approaches are healthy and that it's a core tenant of the College of Policing. But also I think organisations like ours, like the Society of Evidence-Based Policing, that is definitely there for practitioners and professional researchers to work together. And that has had an effect where we go out and we communicate research evidence to people that says sometimes what you thought you knew you didn't know and is wrong and sometimes the stuff you have been doing is actually right and let's work out how to do it better so uh, I think you know 10 years ago it wasn't really spoken about but now certainly in my police force West Midlands Police it's quite hard for someone to make an assertion about a reduction in crime without saying, and here's the control. Now, that would have never happened 10 years ago. Um, and there's still some police forces where, you know, an evidence-based approach is, is not embraced. And unfortunately, personalities come into it quite a lot and some people don't like it. Um, but the scientific method is, is definitely here to stay. Yeah, so I, I definitely think there's a long way, for example, West Midlands Police to go, but I, I think uh, West Midlands Police, GMP, uh, and increasingly some other police forces are getting, are getting more evidence-based. I, I think it happens through two mechanisms. One is the College of Policing, which provides quite a lot of architecture to support an evidence-based approach. It has base camps, they call it. It's got the What Work Centre, which is you're brilliant and any of your viewers should just go into College of Policing What Works. They've got a great bubble diagram that really highlights everything that's effective. So they provide quite a lot of infrastructure and then uh, the way I think it really spreads is like anything that's contagious um, and I think it's through word of mouth and it's by people getting involved. The leaders who I have seen get involved in evidence-based policing have been involved in a small trial for example or they've done something in an evidence-based approach involved their staff and then their staff see the benefit of it and they've, they've engaged in evidence-based approaches and have in, uh, infected other staff and it, and it is like a contagion and you can you can track in actual fact uh, and I could track in West Midlands you know the first bit of work we did some people got involved caught the bug caught it did some more research other people involved in that, they caught the bug and it sort of spreads that way. So I'm of a firm view really, you, you can say it and tell it all you like, but unless our teams are involved in it, it won't necessarily be done as much as it should. No, I, I think it's a bottom-up approach, but uh, let's not be mutually exclusive here. To be bottom-up, you need top cover. So. Um, you know, the, I think the first randomised control trial we did in the West Midlands was uh, about antisocial behaviour when I was on a counter-terrorism unit. Um, but the people, the staff on the ground, the PCs and some of the sergeants who were involved in it, now many of them went on to do other bits of evidence-based work that has had a huge impact here in the West Midlands. Uh, and then they sort of infected other people. Um, so I think if you don't have top cover, and I can think of police forces at the moment where the top cover has changed and people are not in support of evidence-based approaches, that suddenly it really disenfranchises staff who were involved in it and they think, do you know what, there's no point doing this anymore. So you need authority from the top, but definitely if it's going to make a difference, ground level up. The, 
there's not a lot of evidence about things that really backfire. So scared straight is quite a tired example, I think, but we use it just to demonstrate what an evidence-based approach is. There's quite a lot of evidence around what's just ineffective. So it's a, like a waste of time, really. You do something and you think it's great, but it's not actually doing anything beneficial. So perhaps one of the biggest experiments that we did in the West Midlands that has made a huge impact was uh, an experiment called Turning Point. Perhaps we'll talk about experiments in a bit because uh, I don't want any of your viewers to think that evidence-based policing is solely about randomised control trials. Uh, that's not right, but uh, randomised control trials have a place and we did a big randomised control trial based on some research that we'd read that showed that short-term prison sentences have a backfiring effect. Uh, so as you know, in policing, our Pelian principle is to prevent crime. And yet the evidence and the data was telling us we spend all our time catching these people. We send them to prison and it makes them cause more crime. Now that is a huge contradiction or it's like a gremlin in the machinery of how we practice policing where our effort is to prevent crime, but and actually we potentially might be creating it. So uh, th that was really inconvenient evidence, if you like, uh, and we wanted to do something about it. So uh, working with Peter Nehru from Cambridge University and Professor Sherman and others, uh, we devised a trial called Turning Point, where people who were about to be charged, so this is beyond the cautioning level, were randomly allocated into two groups. Uh, one group was charge them as usual and they go to court. The other group was go and see an offender manager who would work through a contract with you, try and understand what behavior had happened and what you should do as a result of that. And if you stuck to that sort of informal contract with the officer, after six months, nothing. Um, but if you didn't and you breached that contract, then we called it the sort of Damocles would come down and you'd be charged as usual. Now the data years later was analyzed from the people who'd gone to court and the people uh, who had been referred to offender managers and we saw significant differences. So firstly, people who had gone to court were arrested more, they caused more harm and they cost more money. And those who were diverted uh, were arrested less, caused less harm and saved the police a load of money. So. That was an experiment that demonstrated a principle that we don't actually have to create more crime as policing, we can do something about it. And as a result of that, um, we created whole teams within our CID environment that sort of processed prisoners in a very similar fashion, um, adopting those principles. And similarly then, um, Durham Police have uh, followed that principle with uh, Operation Checkpoint, doing a very similar thing, but instead of referring away from courts to police officers they've referred them to non-police officers um, and I, I believe uh, early signs are that that looks promising so that's a fine example of how we took an experiment and mainstreamed it into how we operate and I've got a and, and another just a quite a nifty one as well if, uh, if, if you're ready for it and that's um, working with the behavioral uh, insight team where uh, we can talk more about behavioral insights if you want to in a minute but we were sending out three and a half thousand fines a month to motorists in the West Midlands for speeding and the way it works here in the UK is you don't get the fine straight away you get a letter saying we've caught you speeding do you accept this uh, if you do respond and we'll decide whether you get a course or whether you go to court now if you read that letter, and I have to confess I have been caught speeding and I, and I got the letter, uh, it's written in legal mumbo jumbo by probably lawyers and police officers and it really misses the point and it's confusing and you don't really know what to do. And what we found was that uh, up to 40% of respondents or people were failing to respond to the letter because they probably put it in a pile somewhere and, and it wouldn't operate well. So we just changed the letter. Uh, and we put a picture of a lamppost on it with teddy bears, you know, uh, and some truthful data around the amount of children killed uh, by speeding motorists, and we simplified the form. And then we tried the normal form one week, 
and the new form another week, normal form one week, new form another week, aggregated the data. And the response rates were tremendous. So people paid 20% quicker, they re-offended 20% less, and they went to court or they responded correctly 40% more just by changing a letter. Um, and the only reason we knew that was because we took an evidence-based approach. We tested it against the normal letter. So we, we did our sort of randomized control trial with that, saving the force up to a million and a half pounds a year. One small, tiny innovation uh, tested rigorously uh, that becomes mainstream. And that experiment's now been replicated up to seven times around the world. That depends on how rigorous you want your evaluation to be. Now, uh, I am not somebody who says everything has to be gold-plated. So if you're a sergeant or a constable or member of police staff, I think it is perfectly reasonable to say, I'm going to try this new way of operating in a couple of areas or with a couple of offenders and have a couple of control areas. Um, and we'll see if there's a mean difference between those two areas, in which case we do that ourselves. Of course, that would never pass muster with a journal or with an academic institution, but it would be a lot more rigorous than what we've done previously. And so that's a, you know, a PCSO or a police officer or a member of police staff doing it themselves. For the experiment in relation to Turning Point, that was a large scale, complex, rigorous evaluation in Cambridge University. Uh, helped us with that and did a lot of the analytics uh, and that was through a grant that they were they were provided with so it didn't cost West Midlands Police anything. Same with the Behavioural Insights team, they did the analysis on the data for the speeding trial but again they received funding from a philanthropic institution to do that analysis so it cost West Midlands Police nothing. So uh, I don't think really there's many police forces at the moment that have the internal capability to do very strong, rigorous evaluations. But I, every force has the capability to do quite strong ones. Uh, and, you know, <clears throat> I've written before on the sort of curve that you need, depending on the rigor you need and the cost you want to uh, invest on whether you should go external or internal. But there's a, there's a beautiful symbiotic relationship that we can have with professional researchers where they are very much in the UK remunerated by demonstrating impact and the way they do that is through working with police so we exchange our uh, I guess our site and our what we do and our practices and our data for their professional research expertise and no money changes hands at all that's how I would uh, see it operating Yeah, and, and so we share the results in a number of ways. If, if the experiment is rigorous enough, you know, we publish it. Um, but that's read largely by academics. But it is picked up in systematic reviews and then uh, explored on the What Works website, for example, and, uh, and other, other websites. Otherwise, we do it through conferences. So conferences like the Society of Evidence-Based Policing conferences, the Society of Evidence-Based Policing has got regional coordinators who run local conferences sometimes, as, you know, really good ones in the southwest and southeast. Um, and otherwise, word of mouth, uh, you know, putting it in, in things like police professional and also subject matter expert conferences. So, for example, there was a road safety conference where that speeding trial was spoken about and other people heard about it. So there are a, a whole manner of places that can pick up on that and things like your website. So, you know, there's not a type of person who does evidence-based policing and I really want to get away from any ideas that this is about degrees or levels of education. Some of the best pieces of research I've seen done in policing have been done by people who haven't got degrees uh, and who just want to make a difference. You know, some of the longest serving people with who don't have degrees or anything like that can make a huge impact by being evidence-based. And um, so my, my advice to them was, um, 
there's this lovely phrase if you want to walk on water you've got to get out of the boat and i would say just do it you know have a go linking to people who can assist i mean there's very few police forces at the moment who would say that they don't want to do evidence-based policing so there will be experts in the policing contact the society of evidence-based policing you can email them people will contact you and support you the college of policing will support you there'll be a whole host of academics who would want to work with you if if you wanted to do something more rigorous but uh, it's incredibly satisfying I think as a police officer you know if you're a PCSO just doing something yourself you know you could say right um, I'm gonna do this tactic and so something I've thought about recently quite a lot was um, insecure cars so a lot of PCSOs around the country go around and they'll test car doors and if they're open they'll knock on the house and say that your car door's open. And now I don't know if that's worthwhile or not. It might be, it might not be, but any PCSO could say, right, these 10 streets, I'm gonna test all the doors rigorously over the next you know, month or two months, and the another 10 streets I'm not going to. And then let's look at the theft of insecure vehicles from those 10 streets to not the other 10 streets, and they could do all that analysis themselves. And they could then present it to the force and go, look, this is what I found. And in actual fact, we've made a difference here, and so everybody should do it. Or, do you know what, it didn't make any difference. So my advice to all the PCSOs checking car, door, car doors is don't. And, and I don't know what the answer is, but that's a fine example, for example, of somebody who doesn't need any expert sort of input to just go out and do some stuff and take the initiative. Society of Evidence-Based Policing has got three aims really. It wants to encourage the policing family to communicate best research evidence and this is what we're doing right now, uh, to use it. So we, we don't want to sit in our ivory towers pontificating about what works and what doesn't. We want to actually use it um, and I'll sp speak more about that in a bit if you'll let me remind me about the triple T. Mm -hmm. And then we want to produce it. So. Um, police officers, police staff, we want to actually, you know, our whole world is a laboratory and we can do and understand stuff better if we take an evidence-based approach. So that's our three aims. Um, we're really ambitious as a very small charity, but we're, we're run by people who are really busy, like you and me and, and others. So really our, our offer at the moment is some internet content, but an incredibly cheap conferences. So you've, you've just been to the one at the Royal Society for £85. You know, and with the level of speakers we've got, international people from around the world, you, you'd pay £1,000 for that really easily, but we're not interested in making money, we're interested in achieving our aims, so that's a big bonus. We have a network of regional coordinators who bring together meetings, um, like, like the national meeting, but on a local basis, and who share best practice. That, that's where we are at the moment, but we, we want to achieve so much more, um, but we're unable to. But we're looking at bringing someone into employment soon, uh, so, so I think you'll see some changes. What I would say is you can join SEBP in 10 minutes. Just go onto the website, click on the form, put your details on, you automatically go onto a mailing list, you're then a member, and, um, and you'll, you'll get some inputs across on email, uh, and hopefully that will increase. And there's different models of SCBPs around the world, but that, that's what SCBP is. And um, a question I'm often asked is, so what's the difference between SCBP and the College of Policing? Well, look, they're very different. You know, the college is a huge outfit. Um, they've got some really good people in there working on evidence-based policing, doing the what works, providing quite a lot of the architecture. I think we really work well with the college just by being agents of communication, building enthusiasm for evidence-based approaches. I always say we're sort of a hearts and minds sort of organisation where we really get police officers and staff to do stuff in an evidence-based manner. So that, that's what we, we do. An oft criticism of evidence-based policing is uh, tell me something I don't know. Um, you know, evidence-based policing will say uh, this is really effective and then an officer will say well yeah I know that's really effective. Uh, and Sherman came up with this nice uh, sort of three R's and three T approaches. So he would argue that the traditional policing is three R's. Uh, it's response policing, it's random patrol, and it's reactive investigation. 
That's what police officers around the world do all the time. And it needs to evolve into a triple T organization by targeting, firstly, the first one is targeting. So how do we target our assets most effectively? So who do you know are the, you know, the, the top 10 worst offenders or the top 10 repeat victims or where you need to put your officers uh, most or which places existing, which has the most harm, which domestic violence relationship is most dangerous, you target. And that's very much by adopting the scanning approach, scanning and analysis approach, if you take the SARA methodology from pop policing. The next one is then you test what's effective. So once you've targeting your resources effectively, you test. So if you don't know something is effective, let's do a little test and understand and evaluate whether it is effective or not. And the third T then is probably the most interesting because it's called tracking. And this is what um, I think is really interesting. And, and I think what Sherman means by tracking is when you understand something is effective or not, track your staff and your activity to really know and understand that they are engaged in what works. So a fine example of this is hotspot policing, which now is incredibly cliched and everyone goes, oh, please don't tell me any more evidence about hotspot policing. But the amount of work that officers actually do on hotspot policing is severely limited and if we took a better tracked approach we would have our officers in the right place at the right time doing the right thing there's some great data that tom kirchmeyer has just produced uh, from a big force where he's mapped patrol areas of police officers and police staff on sort of proactive patrol and he's found a completely inverse relationship between where people patrol and crime hotspots. You know, so people aren't patrolling in the areas where there is the greatest crime. In actual fact, quite the opposite. And I sort of understand that, you know, when you're working hard all day, sometimes you don't want to go to a place where you know <coughs> there's going to be a, uh, a load of issues or something. But uh, if, if we take a tracking approach, we can just be that much more effective. And, and that's not a big brother tracking. That's just a a feedback loop where we are saying okay we really need to be in this location at this time make sure you're there and and let's understand if we are there or not that, that's that's what we mean by tracking for me there's two types of question one is what works and that often requires an empirical form of analysis where we might do some data analysis, we might do some statistics, we might aggregate data and understand some of the outcomes. Uh, and so you need probably need to be a little bit au fait with how we use data, um, particularly if you're using things like randomized control trials and forest plots and other technical issues like that, that, that you know, professional researchers can assist us as cops with. Some, if your question is what's happening and why is it happening? Often that would benefit from a more qualitative approach. Uh, and again, you know, police officers are not short of opinions. They will tell you why something is happening and they will tell you what works without any evidence whatsoever. Um, and so uh, if, for example, you want to understand, so why is there a spate of robberies in this area? You might want to go out and interview all the offenders who've been caught in that area and try and understand motivation do some analysis of the victims uh, if you want to understand why someone's behaving in a particular way you know an empirical approach isn't going to answer that question but some interviews focus groups ethnographic research where you sort of live with the people that's really useful and I think there's probably three things that combine together to make a really effective police officer or police service and, and one is the qualitative approach uh, one is the quantitative approach being good with data and then one is just experience and if there's anything I want to get across is that we don't we're not evidence-based at the expense of experience if you can meld experience and street craft and knowledge with data and qualitative research together I think you'll you'll have a sort of perfect approach and, and that's what we would always try and push there's something around digesting research that any officer can do so they can look at the 
College of Policing website and take notice of what it says and just engage in that activity. I think a lot of stuff you see published will be by its very nature quite rigorous if it's if it is empirical uh, and it'll be rigorous if it's if it is qualitative so I'm, I'm just trying to think of some research that I mean that that example for example of trying car doors is one that I think would be really uh, really easy to do and isn't a randomized controlled trial um, I did some research on phoning back victims of car crime to see if we got any better results from phoning them back rather than visiting them rather than not phoning them back at all and that just involved a spreadsheet and then looking at some outcome data to because because it was it's one of those things where everyone says okay well let's phone everyone back and see if we can get any more evidence well that, that's okay but what's the effect going to be on investigative outcomes and that's quite easy to analyze um, and then there's quite a lot of existing big data sets out there that you can just cast your lens through as well and have a look at. So I guess some of the some of the groundbreaking studies have been quite high level empirical, but some of the stuff that will just inform us day to day won't make the headlines, but can make a difference in how you operate. I'll point them in a number of directions. So the first one would be College of Policing website on what works. Uh, I would then, there's, there's two books that have recently been written. Uh, Cynthia Lum's done a very good book on evidence-based policing published last year. Uh, I can't remember uh, where's the publisher, but if you just put evidence-based policing and Cynthia Lum in Google, you'll find it. Then uh, Laura Huey and Rene Mitchell have recently published a book on evidence-based policing um, and its growth. Uh, they published that this year, so if you just if you type those two authors in, you'll you'll find it. Um, there's a number of search tools. So Cynthia Lum also has the evidence-based policing matrix that highlights a load of different evidence-based policing approaches and results. There's a thing called the Global Policing Database that has already synthesized all research and you can use it's free. Uh, just put Global Policing Database in um, and type in a net something and it will look, bring up all the relevant academic articles that have been sifted through that are useful for you. So whether that's violence, domestic violence, car theft, you know, sex crimes, whatever it is, you put that in and, and it would bring up all relevant uh, literature. So that, that's where I'd start and of course I'd say join the Society of Evidence-Based Policing, come to a conference, go to some local groups, become an evidence-based policing champion. <coughs> there's, the, there's a lot of good stuff out there. I'm just not sure where Cambridge is on publication of that yet, uh, but I think if you put Operation Turning Point into Google right now, I think there are some PowerPoint slides from previous conferences where people like Jamie Hobday and Larry Sherman have spoken on it. Um, the other thing they can do is just contact the Society of Evidence-Based Policing and we can put them in touch with in touch with people in relation to Turning Point. There is a little book that Sherman and Nehrud wrote called The Sword of Damocles, well that's certainly in the title and that, and that very much underpins the theoretical concept of Turning Point. I'd like to bust some myths really. Um, so myth one is that you need to be a graduate to be involved in evidence-based policing. Wrong. I just think you need to be care you need to massively care about what <coughs> the, the outcomes we're achieving on the street. That's it. And I know you know 99% of police officers and staff do want to do that. Uh, myth two is it's all about randomized control trials. It's not. Um, there's a place for them, but there's a place for uh, qualitative research as well, and there's a place for uh, other types of empirical analysis. You know, if you're doing, if you're targeting testing and tracking, and you might not need a RCT at all. So that's uh, another myth I want to bust. Um, myth three I'd like to bust is that that this is uh, at the expense of experience and knowledge and street craft developed over years and years. No, absolutely not. It needs to complement it. Um, 
and we just need to be well-rounded I think uh, and you know scholars and uh, really brainy people need to understand actually what it's like on the street and what it's like dealing with this stuff and same, at the same time people uh, who work on the street working really hard need to I think understand what data can tell us to make us improve what we do so none of this is mutually exclusive and um, you know in, in our fractious world it's quite easy sometimes just to th throw stuff at each other and and criticize wh whichever side you're on you know if you like qualitative research you criticize the empirical stuff if you like empirical research you criticize the qualitative stuff and if you don't like either but you're a great cop you criticize both the others and and vice versa and no that's not where we're at we're at building uh, an understanding of what's effective together using the best of all those three approaches so they're the perhaps the three myths I'd like to bust the most evidence-based policing allows us much better to understand the impact that we're having and that's really important nowadays when there's not much money sloshing around because we need to demonstrate bang for our buck and we also we're obsessed rightly as policing is making a positive difference um, that uh, anybody can do it uh, and that with the advice that you know we've just spoken about to learn about it to reach out and to uh, to engage in doing it and the third thing I would encourage people to do is just to get involved and just to just to just to think okay uh, what is there out there that would tell me that there might be a better way of doing this how can I test what I'm doing is effective or not get involved and have a go yourself at doing your own analysis it's never going to be perfect and there'll be lots of critics out there and you know Teddy Roosevelt told us it's not the critic that counts let's just get involved and have a go uh, is, is what I would uh, encourage people to do and the more you learn the more you realize you don't know them uh, and, and uh, you know every day is a school day for all of us involved in this so uh, it, it, it's all good and I'm sure you will bring loads of stuff from an investigative side and uh, particularly around investigative interviewing you know there's the you know the research around that is could be really interesting around how we could better uh, engage in interviewing whether that's with victims or witnesses uh, I, I think there's some research out there on it but not a lot uh, and some of the trauma informed stuff I think is really interesting uh, I'd love to see more research on what's effective as far as trauma informed policing and what's effective in challenging ACEs so everybody is talking about adverse childhood experiences at the moment and the data is really strong that shows correlations between ACEs and crime causing people the data is not strong on what policing can do to work with that information so now we have someone who suffers more than four ACEs so what are you going to do as a police officer about that and what do you mean when you say we're going to be trauma informed I'd love to see more research on that thank you for watching I hope you found this content useful you can get access to each episode's transcript with key learning points, timestamps and references if you get yourself onto my mailing list. Just go to the main website on policesciencedoctor.com and on the bottom of each page you will find a sign-up form for notifications of new content. Just enter your first name, your preferred email address and the type of organization you work for. You will not get any spam, this is just for me to let you know about new content and for you to get access to all the transcripts.